embrace the ideals of equality, respect, and freedom. Originally, these two events were to be followed in 2020 by a 2020 conference to continue these discussions. But due to our current situation with COVID-19, uh, we have decided to launch uh, this virtual series uh, for, uh, with you today. So our overriding theme is what if democracy fails? And tonight's discussion is dehumanization as an initial weapon in the commission of genocide. Dehumanization refers to the act of perceiving victimized subgroups as, com as not completely human. Psychologists distinguish between two groups of non-humanness. One that uh, denies unique human attributes to others by comparing them to animals. The other one denies human nature to others by comparing them, them to objects, as known as objectification, in most cases here in the United States, applied to women. Sociologists emphasize that de dehumanization is not simply a private belief, but a cause and consequence of the importance of social group boundaries. And philosophers, much like psychologists, define dehumanization as the regulation of others to the status of non-humans, uh, non-human animals to deprive them of shared moral codes. More recently, social neuroscience provides evidence that dehumanization has cognitive correlates. When people associate others with animals and objects, brain regions implicated in normal social cognition fail to, to activate. But this leads to the question increasingly common in research on dehumanizing propaganda and its impact on genocide of just how exactly do dehumanizing discourse enters into the brain and body uh, reform social perception. While it is true that genocidal governments and other governments bent on normalizing state violence, such as Rwanda, South Sudan, United States, for example, promote images of unwanted populations as animals and objects, such actions tell us little about how they are received by civilians. So ladies and gentlemen, that is a, a brief overview of what we are hoping to discuss tonight. We are so fortunate to have uh, two world-class panelists with us this evening. And I would certainly like to uh, introduce them at this time. Uh, first, we have uh, Dr. Ken Scott. Uh, Ken graduated with honors from both the University of Colorado Boulder and Harvard Law School and has uh, devoted his career to public interest law. He served for 12 years as an assistant U.S. attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice, where he investigated and prosecuted some of the Justice Department's largest criminal cases. As chief of the complex uh, contra uh, prosecution section, specializing in white collar, financial and environmental crimes, in, two, in, in January 1998, Ken moved with his wife and two sons to The Hague, Netherlands, where he was a senior prosecutor in the International mm -hmm. Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia for 14 years, leading large teams of international lawyers, investigators, military analysts, historians, language staff, paralegals, and others, in successfully investigating and litigating cases against 13 major war criminals, including a prime minister, defense minister, two army chiefs of staff and the head of the military police, as well as a regional governor, other senior military commanders and a regional warlord. In recognition of his work in the former Yugoslavia, Ken received uh, the Most Star Peace Award, Peace Prize in, 19, uh, in November, 2017. Other re previous recipients include Nelson Mandela, Vaclav Havel and Jacques Chirac. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we are in very fine company. Our second guest <clears throat> is Dr. Ved Nanda. Ved Nanda is a distinguished university professor at the University of Denver, where he founded the International Legal Studies Program in 1972 and now directs the Ned Vanda Center for International and Comparative Law. The center was established in his honor by alumni and friends who have also endowed a professorship in his name. He is an honorary professor at the University of Delhi, India, faculty of law and has received honorary doctorates of law from Suka University in Tokyo, Japan and 
Bundapal, Bundapand University in Hansi, uh, India. He has taught and lectured in numerous universities in the US and abroad. Professor Nanda holds many leadership positions in the global uni international law community, including the World Jurist Association, American Society of International Law, International Law Association, American Law Institute, and the American Bar Association's Human Rights Center and Section of International Law. He has served as U.S. Delegate to the World Federation of United Nations Associations in Geneva and on the Governing Council of the United Nations Association of the U.S. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Ken Scott and Dr. Ved Nanda. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much, um, Alfonso. It's very kind of you. Thank you for your kind words and good evening to everyone. Um, very happy to be here, and I want to thank the coalition for the uh, concerning uh, global gen against global genocide for organizing this event. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to spend the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes or so talking broadly about uh, genocide, some of the warning signs of genocide, and, and in particular dehumanization, and then hopefully we'll turn it over to my good friend, Vednanda, and also to uh, Dr. Porter to, to continue the discussion in some more specific ways. So let me share my screen with you. I'll be marching through a PowerPoint pretty much directly. So at the international Sorry, the screen is not showing again. Is it on now? There we go. There yes. We go. No, it's thank, yeah. thank you very much. So, well, now this isn't working. There we go. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in, in Washington, D.C. has stated that only a conscious concerted attempt to learn from past errors can prevent recurrence to any racial, religious, ethnic, or national group. And I think that's quite worthwhile to remember. So let's just talk a little bit about genocide, just to set the scene. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. That includes killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. You can see how that would, and that would lead to the end of the group if you're preventing births. And E, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Again, you can see how that would lead to the destruction of the group if you're forcibly transferring children away from them. <clears throat> Article three of the Convention Against Genocide provides that the following acts are punishable. Of course, genocide, conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. Now, if you go to the elements of crime of the International Criminal Court in The Hague, and that is the World Permanent Court, the International Criminal Court, or ICC, it sets out the elements of these crimes, and we're not gonna go through each one of them now, but it sets out specifically each item, each element that has to be proven to establish these international crimes. I think what's particularly important is to recognize that killing is interchangeable with causing death. The conduct may include, but is not necessarily restricted to, acts of torture, rape, sexual violence, or inhuman or degrading treatments. I think it's important to recognize this one. This is an important one. Genocide by deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. That requires that the perpetrator or perpetrators inflicted certain conditions of life upon one or more persons, 
Such person or persons belong to a particular national, ethnical, racial, or religious group. The perpetrator intended to destroy in whole or in part that national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. The conditions of life were calculated to bring about the physical destruction of that group in whole or in part. And number five, the conduct took place in the context of a manifest pattern of similar conduct directed against that group or was conduct that could itself affect such destruction. I think when we think of genocide, we think of, and rightly so, we think of the Holocaust and the, the gas chambers and the, and the incinerators that, that, that were used to destroy the six million Jews in Europe during World War II. But it doesn't have to be exactly that. It can be this genocide by deliberately inflicting conditions of life calculated to bring about physical destruction. And the International Criminal Court says further, the term conditions of life may include, but is not necessarily restricted to, deliberate deprivation of resources indispensable for survival, such as food or medical services or the systematic expulsion from homes. Further, the term forcibly is not restricted to physical force that may include threat of force of coercion, such as that caused by fear of violence, duress, detention, psychological oppression, or abuse of power against such person or persons or another person, or by taking advantage of a coercive environment. So in looking at that, you can see that the definitions of the scope of behavior that's possibly encompassed in genocide is broader than what you might first expect. And as we already mentioned, genocide by imposing measures intended to prevent births, genocide by forcibly transferring children. Now, Adama Ding, an African who is the former UN Special Advisor for Prevention of Genocide, has said the following things. Genocide is when you're being killed, not for what you have done, but for who you are. Genocide must and can be prevented if we have the will of applying the lessons learned from Rwanda and Srebrenica and the Holocaust. It is important to identify risk factors that would lead to genocide rather than to wait to when people are being killed. One of the really important things that's been recognized in the last 15 or 20 years, especially, and again, continuing on with Adama Ding, but one of the really important things is that we know from our experience that genocide is not a single event. It is a process. It is a process that takes place over time with planning and resources which could be halted at any stage. The Holocaust, for example, did not start with the gas chambers and the Rwanda genocide did not start with the slayings. It started with the dehumanization of a specific group of persons. Now, in talking about dehumanization, excuse me, dehumanization, <clears throat> my apologies. Let's let's stop and pause on the ten signs of genocide and see where this fits into the overall picture. The first sign of genocide is classification. The differences between people are not respected. There's a division of us and them, which can be carried out using stereotypes or excluding people who are perceived to be different. It is all about the other, the other or otherness, not us, but them. The second stage or element is symbolization. This is a visual manifestation of hatred. As you may recall, Jews in Nazi Europe were forced to wear yellow stars to show that they were different. The third element or stage is discrimination. The dominant group denies civil rights or even citizenship to identified groups. The 1935 Nuremberg Laws stripped Jews of their German citizenship and made it illegal for them to do many jobs or to marry German non-Jews. The fourth is dehumanization. Those who are perceived as different are treated with no form of human rights or personal dignity. They are less than human. You might remember that during the genocide in Rwanda, the Tutsis were often referred to as cockroaches. 
the Nazis referred to Jews as vermin. There's all those things that reduce people to human, reduce people to less than human beings. And however, and however that's done, including by language. The fifth element is organization. Genocides are always planned. Regimes of hatred often train those who go on to carry out the destruction of the people. That's often done by way of militias or third parties. Sometimes that leads the government leaves the government in a situation of plausible deniability. Well, it's not us. We're not the ones doing it. It's those gangs of people out there that are doing it. But in reality, so often the gangs are either sanctioned or allowed by or even encouraged by the government or authorities involved. Polarization. Propaganda begins to be spread by hate groups. The Nazis used the newspaper Disturmer to spread and incite messages of hate about Jewish people. And I know here, I might include, maybe in our current situation in some parts of the world, I might move polarization up even ahead of dehumanization. And you might even, I, I invite you to consider the current situation in the United States in terms of the deep, deep polarization that we have in our country. That is definitely one of the stages of genocide. The seventh stage or element of genocide is preparation. Prepar uh, perpetrators plan the genocide. They often use euphemisms such as the Nazis phrase, quote, the final solution to cloak their intentions. They create fear of the victim group building up armies and weapons. The eighth element or stage is persecution. Victims are identified because of their ethnicity or religion and death lists are drawn up. People are sometimes segregated into ghettos, deported or starved, and the property is often expropriated. Genocidal massacres began. And again, you only need to think of the Holocaust, what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia, what has happened more recently in Myanmar, with the exclusion, expulsion, and, and gross mistreatment of the Rohingya and others in the world today. The ninth, the ninth stage of genocide is extermination. The hate group murders their identified victims in a deliberate and systematic campaign of violence. Millions of lives have been destroyed or changed beyond recognition through genocide, as all of you know. And the 10th stage, interestingly enough, is denial. Even now, even, even some 60 or 70 years after the Holocaust, we have people who deny that the Holocaust actually took place. They continue to deny that these things didn't happen. The perpetrators or later generations denied the existence of any crime. And again, even, and I can tell you from my own personal experience as a prosecutor concerning Bosnia war crimes, I ran into many people, Serbs and Croats in particular, who continue to deny, even years later, despite the extensive evidence of the crimes that were committed, they continue to deny it. No, these things didn't really happen. It is all, well, in, term, in common terminology, it was fake news. It didn't really happen. These things were just propaganda. And in reality, we know that in fact, they all did happen, just as the Holocaust happened. So we're focusing this evening on dehumanize, <clears throat> dehumanize. To deprive someone or something of human qualities, personality, or dignity. That is a definition of dehumanize. To subject someone, such as a prisoner, to conditions or treatments that are inhuman or degrading. For example, someone might say, you treat people with respect, you get respect back. You treat them like animals, you strip search them, you dehumanize them, you lock them up, you don't feed them, you're going to get that back. It also means to address or portray someone in a way that obscures or demeans that person's humanity or individuality. Again, such as propaganda. Propaganda that dehumanizes the enemy. I'm always struck by the way language is used to dehumanize others. 
And you can just think of propaganda, think of posters, war posters, other things that have been done to dehumanize the other people, the other, the other. Treating Chicago and victims as merely a tally necessarily dehumanizes its victims, but it also obscures so much of the larger story about violence. It also means to remove or reduce human involvement or interaction in something such as a process or place. For example, we might say, nurses are fearful that the use of technology will dehumanize patient care, or that social media dehumanizes personal interactions, taking them out of the dining room, the neighborhood store and workplace into a nowhere we call cyberspace. Again, look at other common definitions of dehumanization. To deprive of positive quality, human qualities. To treat someone as though he or she is not a human being. And I think it's particularly interesting to look at the synonyms for dehumanize. Animalize, bestialize, brutalize. Those, those additional words really drive home the point of what dehumanization is really about. To animalize, to bestialize, to brutalize, to reduce the other to something less than human. Now an important feature, important feature in closing, and I'm closing up my part of this presentation that we see in moving toward this stage of genocide or the existence of hate speech and hate groups. According to UN definition, hate speech is any kind of communication in speech, writing, or behavior that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are based on their religion, ethnicity, nationality, or similar differences. A hate group is a social group that advocates and practices hatred, hostility, or violence toward members of a race, ethnicity, nation, religion, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other designated sector of society. According to the FBI, a hate group's primary purpose is to promote animosity, hostility, and malice against persons belonging, again, to a race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, or ethnicity or national origin, which differs from that of the members of the organization. What are some of the things that we can look for? If, 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 we're, if we're watching our society and watching other societies for signs of genocide, and for dehumanization as, as in specifically. What are the, some of the signs that we can look for? As the powerless group's rights are taken away and their quality of life declines, the dominant group will deny their humanity. Number two, this helps the dominant group to rationalize their inhumane treatment of the oppressed group. And over time, the oppressed group will no longer be regarded as human. Dehumanization overrides the human revulsion against killing and plays a larger role, a large role in propaganda and hate speech. You know, as much as we might think differently sometimes, killing someone is very difficult. It's, killing another human being is difficult, but it's much easier when that person or that thing is reduced to something less than human. Listen for the powerless groups being described or referred to as animals vermin, or a disease, or rapist, or drug dealers. And some of that language may be similar to things we've heard in our own society in recent years. Identify the increasing popularity of hate speech in political rallies, speeches, on radio and TV. And watch out for euphemisms in ideological language as they often hide the horrible nature of their implications. Words like purification or cleansing often disguise the hate that is under the surface. I'm gonna conclude with that and turn it over to my very good friend and colleague, Vednanda, 
and then later Alfonso Porter for additional insights and assistance thank, of all of us to thank understand you very much, Ken. what this is about. Excellent job. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Ved Nanda. Ben? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for your very kind introduction. Um, distinguished colleague, great friend, Ken Scott, uh, has really in a comprehensive manner. Um, let me just see that, yeah, it's up. Um, provided us background, a review, overview of all that we are going to be talking about today. I think to begin, all of us have got to agree that uh, genocide uh, begins in a very real way with human dehumanization. And uh, genocide is not any single event. It is a process and obviously you need planning, you need resources, and it can be stopped. But uh, as very clearly mentioned, once you make somebody less than human, then you easily can commit atrocities, you can torture, you can kill. And when you say that the person is not human, um, many of you have heard even these days, our President Donald Trump frequently dehumanizing, um, especially migrants. And uh, for example, I was looking in California, Sanctuary State Roundtable, and he talked about members of transnational gangs like MS-13. He declared, these are people, these are animals. And he has often mentioned to immigrants as rapists, criminals. And um, um, there is an ugly history, as you look back, of genocidal governments that have used similar kind of names, name calling for them. Um, my friend referred uh, Nazis to be Nazis referring to Jews as rats and Mormons, and Hutus, they were um, calling Tutsis, as he said, cockroaches, snakes. And um, that's really what has happened all the time in the past history, in our history. Um, what does dehumanization do? It uh, decommissions our moral sentiments. And then we don't seem to have any moral obligation about those about whom we feel that they are not humans. And once you don't call them humans, dehumanize them, then you can crush them under your foot like an insect. And um, you mentioned about Sudan, probably all the time you hear about it, not simply Darfur, but in many places um, in the country, it had happened under Bashir, al-Bashir. And uh, then what else happens is that we become indifferent to the, those kind of atrocities. Um, as was said by one of the scholars and philosophers, we think of Serbs or Nazis as animals because ravenous beasts of prey are animals. We think of Muslims as Jews being herded into concentration camps as animals because cattle are animals. Neither sort of animal is very much like us. And there seems to be no point in human being being involved in quarrels between animals and animals can be treated not as humans. I um, want to take you um, to Germany, Holocaust, after that Nuremberg. And what happened in Nuremberg, as you remember, is the rest of us, we know about generals and about um, 
those who were responsible for policies that uh, led to that aggression and led to all that cruelty and death and destruction. Uh, but I want to remind you about 20 doctors, three administrators, and these are the ones called Nuremberg doctors and their trial. They had participated in Hitler's euthanasian program. And how many people? 200,000 people, mentally, physically handicapped. They were people deemed unfit to live, gassed to death, and medical experiments upon them, Roma, Polish, Jewish, even Russian. Telford Taylor was the principal prosecutor, and he talked about them, and I won't read to you a whole lot. And he said victims of these crimes are numbered in the hundreds of thousands, and they were dehumanized, and they were not seen as individuals at all. They were seen as wretched people, came in wholesale lots, and they were treated worse than animals. Um, I uh, won't take you through, uh, because this is a vivid description of what they were deprived of. Oxygen to simulate higher altitude, parachute jumps, infested with malaria, frozen, exposed to mustard gas, made incisions in their flesh to simulate wounds. Mm, I won't read all of that but it is um, infected with typhus, other deadly diseases, inserted pieces of broken glass, wood shavings into them, then tying off the blood vessels, introducing bacteria in them, poisoned, burned with phosphorus. And um, um, they recognize, recorded their agonized screams and violent convulsions. And it goes on and on and said, you know, they are not human. They don't need to live. Uh, they are deformed. They are not the ones that we can treat as human beings. And they are subhuman creatures. And calling them as subhumans, there are mo no moral rights, no obligations that bind humankind together. And it's wrong to kill a person, but it's permissible to exterminate a rat. And to the Nazis, all these people are rats, dangerous, disease-carrying rats. And that is what happens. These uh, enemies of civilization, they were represented as parasitic organisms, as leeches, lice, bacteria, vectors of contag contagion. So that is what really brought it all together. I think I, um, it's, uh, it's pretty vivid and it's um, um, kind of heart-wrenching to be reading about all that, how they were de dehumanized and um, ravages of that dehumanization um, is very clear in all that happened in those places. Um, spoke about dehumanization the smell of Germany's animal breath. This is now the Russians doing it. So it was not simply the Germans in that Holocaust, but Russians had those pamphlets speaking of the smell of Germany's animal breath. Described Germans as two-legged animals who have mastered the technique of war and um, who ought to be annihilated. Germans are not human beings. If you kill one German, kill another. There is nothing more amusing for us than a heap of German corpses. Just uh, an idea of what um, meant for them. Uh, Red Army, in the course of a single night, the Red Army killed 72 women and one man. Most of the women had been raped and witnesses who made it to the West 
talked of a poor village girl and again, all kind of atrocities on her. Um, I was looking at um, um, the present time, not simply Rohingya um, in Burma, but also Bengal, Bengalis have done, Bangladesh has done in Chittagong Hill nations. And I have been there, but military assisted invasion there and then kind of genocidal practices because looking at all those people, they said, they are not like us. Their culture needs to be annihilated and they need to be killed because they are not humans. As you think about this country, but maybe think about the, this hemisphere and um, Columbus arriving here and all that happened later on about those uh, native people. Just to give you numbers, there were 72 million inhabiting the Western hemisphere in 1492. And I don't think you can imagine that. By 1900, and think about it. In North America, 5 million were there, now occupied by the continental United States in 1492. By 1900, 250,000 out of those 5 million remained. And here, instead of 72 million, 4 million were left after a few centuries. So I want to spend a little time now in looking at uh, a person. Um, I was looking at the genocide, ethnocide in the United States, but I want to go along with dehumanization and how dehumanization can occur when you think of them, as we said, primitives, subhuman, savages, vermins, nuisances, but also you destroy their culture. And that is called ethnocide. And so I do want to spend a little time on it, uh, but maybe I should at least mention one more thing that as you think about American Indians, their targeted schools as ethnocide because in those schools, um, I think uh, recently there have been uh, several reports about them. And as you look at uh, Australia and New Zealand and there the same kind of thing happened to the natives there. Um, in this country, um, one, one number probably I should mention that, 150,000 between that and 500,000 Native Americans, they died in 40 wars with Americans and Europeans between 1775 and 1894. Um, let me begin today talking with a person who was responsible for the genocide convention, genocide treaty to a great extent. And on genocide treaty, my friend Ken has uh, given us a pretty comprehensive, not simply background, but a very scholarly and uh, I think uh, accurate, but comprehensive view overview of that. Um, what does Lemkin say? He said, the history of genocide, especially in antiquity, is written in the pages of archaeology. The murder of civilizations was not yet a fully told story. Impact of the concept, concept of genocide could be greatly enriched if cultural losses that occurred through assassination of civilizations could be brought before the eyes of the world. Dr. Scott mentioned to us the intent, intent to destroy a group. 
And what it included was the intention to destroy their way of life. Otherwise, the task, this horrific task would be incomplete. Attacks on culture, in Lemkin's view, came first. And that was because you look, looked at those people and felt that uh, dehumanization is the appropriate thing. Um, German poet Heinrich Hein said, first they burn books and then they start burning bodies. First they burn books, then they start burning bodies. And um, Lemkin asserted that I want to quote him, physical and biological genocide are always preceded by cultural genocide or by an attack on the symbols of the group or by violent interference with religious or cultural activities. Um, we don't at times pay a great deal of attention to this ethnocide or cultural genocide. And I want to remind you that as Lemkin talked about all this and looked at and worked on it as a scholar on genocide, he had thought about ethnocide and genocide in the same, um, in the same setting. And um, um, he said the last war, that was the Second World War, has focused our attention on the phenomenon, uh, phenomena of the destruction of whole populations, national, racial, and religious groups. And here it's important, both biologically and culturally. And because their cultures were not seen as something worth having. Um, I think I want to take you um, about uh, what happened at the United Nations when this issue came up. And uh, he's the one who had talked about uh, both ethnocide and along with that genocide in the same terms. And um, I think I need to uh, not take too long. So let me take only about five minutes and in a bullet point kind of way, bring it to your attention. Um, so, he started talking about both of them, Gen genocide, ethnocide. And he wanted to have genocide as a denial of the right of existence of the entire human groups. And um, the Secretary General at that time, Trigger Lee, he appointed him as um, one of the three independent experts and asked to produce a draft of a genocide convention. And Lemkin said that I want to have physical, biological, and cultural genocide as one area put together. So cultural genocide was part of the draft that he submitted and uh, that was Article 3. And I want briefly to mention to you what happened to it. As the discussion debate began, there were countries, Brazil, Peru, Netherlands. They said that the idea, the notion is too big and should not be included. Denmark, Sweden, Iran, United States, questions, should it be placed on the same level as physical genocide? And the United States delegates suggested that uh, the genocide is shocking to the world, but that cultural genocide did not shock the conscience of mankind to the same degree as the uh, physical genocide. So the final vote was 25 in favor of deletion, 16 opposed, four abstentions. But then what happened is that it came before the General Assembly. And there, United Kingdom, 
Netherlands, France, Denmark, Belgium, United States, Canada, Sweden, Brazil, Brazil, New Zealand, Australia. They are the colonial settler countries. They carried the day because they were able to take the cultural genocide out of it. Then Denmark cautioned if the convention included reference to cultural genocide, said it might even become a tool for political propaganda instead of an international legal instrument. And uh, Sweden said that, uh, what does it mean? We had converted the labs to Christianity. And uh, could you then accuse us that we had committed an act of cultural genocide? In any event, that uh, did not pass. Um, South Africa, obviously, at that time with the apartheid, apartheid policy. And uh, like the representative of New Zealand, he said he wished to point the danger latent in the provisions of Article 3, where primitive or backwards people were concerned. No one could, for example, approve the inclusion in the Convention of Provision for the Protection of such customs as cannibalism. So again, they were not treated, these people um, who were talking about this as um, um, human beings of the same kind that they were because their customs were um, primitive. Um, I think a Greek delegation um, had said that, um, you know, you might rethink about it. Uh, and I want to take you then very briefly to the Indigenous People Declaration that was adopted by the General Assembly. And I simply want to mention to you that they do talk at, in that declaration about cultural genocide and do talk in that, that Indigenous people have the collective and individual right not to be subjected to ethnocide and cultural genocide. And it called for the prevention of redress for a number of acts, beginning with any action which has the aim or effect of depriving them of their integrity as distinct people. So let me simply conclude by saying that uh, once you dehumanize people, once you destroy their culture, then it's very easy to treat them as less than humans. And then it becomes very easy to have atrocities upon them and then might lead to genocide. And the final comment that I want to make is that at times it creates insensitivity for others also as it becomes kind of a norm. So dehumanization is the first step that leads on to genocide and we need to stop that. There are people who would say that, you know, it's not simply propaganda that does it, that uh, there are other factors that can be taken into account and that we at least can prevent and we can take action to counter all those dehumanizing effects. But thank you very much. Excellent, thank you very much, Ved. And again, thank you, Ken. Uh, I've got a couple of questions as we, as we kind of move into the Q&A. And at this point, I, at this uh, time in the program, I would certainly invite uh, those who are in, uh, engaging with us to uh, go to the chat room and uh, place a question. And uh, hopefully we can get to that. But can you, can you guys please talk about the power dynamic here, for example? Um, does the group who is not in power, can they, can they dehumanize? And so in, in other words, can that script be flipped in some way? Uh, so do they, do they have the power so that if you are a minority group in the, in the United States, for example, and you then began to start to dehumanize the, the majority population, is there any power in that? Ken, what do you, can we go to you, Ken? Uh, unmute. 
Ken, unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah. Unmute, Ken. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. Well, I think any group potentially can dehumanize either others or themselves. Um, unfortunately, that, that's a possibility. I don't know why it is that people would do that. It's not very clear why one would choose to dehumanize themselves, but it might be, it, there is a power difference. There's no question that it's a question of power. Most of those who dehumanize other people are the people in power. It's, it's a political class. It's the elite class of a society. It's the majority, it's the majority of a society. Those are typically the people who conduct uh, dehumanization and carry out, ultimately carry out genocide. But it is possible, I suppose, for whatever reason, for a group, for a minority group to dehumanize itself. Ben, would you like to? I, I would in? simply say that it will have absolutely no effect, no impact. It is a political power. It is today, as you think about it, uh, they can keep saying they can do anything, uh, but that dehumanization is not going to lead to anything. And I think that simply is a reaction to what the majority might be doing. So I don't think that it has got any meaningful outcome that can come out of that dehumanization. Dehumanization the other way can lead to atrocities, can lead to genocide. But here, dehumanization by a minority that is there, it can create trouble, but it cannot lead to genocide. They are not capable of doing it. So it does dehumanization in and of itself motivate others to kill? That it can, yeah, it does. And I think what happens is as uh, Ken had mentioned and I, seconded it and uh, history tells us and people who have done a whole lot of studies, they inform us that uh, once you have dehumanized, say that the person is not human, then you don't have any obligation toward that person. And if there is no moral obligation, then you can take any action. And you feel, as I mentioned, that you can crush an insect with under your boot and you don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. And you feel that that had to be done. And that is what uh, the Russians did, uh, the Soviets at that time with the Red Army and the Germans did with all those people, Roma and Jews and others. Uh, Ken, does, uh, does dehumanization necessarily lead to, to genocide or? Um, wow. Is that a motivating factor to kill? Dehumanization, is that a motivating factor to kill? I'm not sure I'd call it a motivating factor all the time, although it certainly can be. It, it is, as, as, both, as both Ben and I have said, it is sort of a precondition to mass violence. Uh, the reality is that for most of us, taking a human life is a very difficult thing to do. Unfortunately, in mass media and television and in, in, in the media industry that we all live in, uh, we see many people killed every night on TV in, in, in dramas and in stories. The reality is it's very difficult to take a human life. And, but what makes it much easier is when you dehumanize that person. They are no longer human. They are something less than human. They are, an, as we said before, they are an animal. They are a beast. They are something less than human. They are a cockroach. They are vermin, and therefore it becomes much easier than at that point to commit killings, mass killings. Mm -hmm. Given that um, these things happen gradually, for example, let's say, for example, you have, you've got a population that's being dehumanized. Um, they don't ne necessarily recognize that they're being dehumanized. They recognize that they're being called names, mm -hmm but may not recognize where that may ultimately lead. So what does that do over time to the psychology of those being dehumanized? Even, even though genocide is not the ultimate aim, what does it do to the victim group over time, psychologically, mentally, emotionally? Right. I think that's pretty close to the cultural genocide that, that Ved was talking about. They may not be being killed 
they're not being physically uh, exterminated, but their self-esteem, their identification as a people, they are being constantly worn down. They're constantly worn down. Their own value, they don't value themselves. They almost, over time, they almost buy into what they're being told. And that is, well, we're not, we're worthless. We're not worth anything. Uh, we are mere peons. And, um, and so even though you don't have the physical extermination, you have a power, you have a, a power dynamic where those people are being essentially uh, put down into a, 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 almost a classless situation where there, there's no, there's no respect for them. There's something, again, something less than fully human. Perhaps Ved can add to that. I think uh, Ken has said it. I don't think that any need needs to be elaborated on it. So then there is that then ostensibly what has occurred with the African-American population in the United States. And as we mentioned at the, at the head of this conversation, we uh, commemorated 400 years uh, in North America. And obviously over that time, we have been constantly browbeat to believe First of all, that you're three-fifths human, and second of all, you're this or that, and then in then having uh, slavery waged against you. So, is that essentially what has what has been happening? Dad, you want to take that first? I think the answer is yes, and I think uh, you can see it today uh, manifesting itself in various ways. Uh, the response to that uh, retaliation, not retaliation. But obviously, uh, because all that has happened, you can see that uh, those uh, wounds are still there. Uh, talk of reparations, talk at the present time of Black Lives Matter. And uh, you can see in our own streets today with those demonstrations and all that is happening, it's an indication of how those kind of uh, wounds don't uh, heal. And uh, that has happened all these centuries in this country after slavery. Okay. I certainly agree with that. I mean, there's no question. Uh, in for the last 400 years, slavery and our treatment of our black brothers and sisters is a tremendous blemish on, on this society. Uh, and we're still, even today, as, we go, as we've seen in the past few months, we are still dealing with it. We hope to think, I think a few years ago, we thought we'd made much more progress that unfortunately than we really have, but there's no question. Um, genocide, ethnocide was practiced against uh, uh, the black Africans as they came into this country. And it's a, it continues to be a terrible blemish, as I say, on our society, no question. And so is that what we're now witnessing on our Southern border? That's one of the questions from a panel, uh, from a, one of our audience members. Is that what we're really seeing on the southern border? And if so, what steps must we take now in order to mitigate it? Ken, go well, ahead. I think it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ben. No, no, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think it. I, I think there's no question that that, that separating children from their families. Um, it, it, it's not perhaps genocide, although although if you did it on a large enough scale as we talked about uh, 45 minutes ago, separating children, taking children away is a form of, ultimately a form of genocide because you're destroying the group. Uh, hopefully it will never get to that point, but it's certainly a, let's say it's a, it's a pre-step. Maybe we're not there yet, but it's certainly a pre-step toward genocide and toward massive mistreatment of people. There's no, no question. I think a dehumanization that's happening on the southern border, um, there is no way that we can either explain it or find uh, uh, at the present time any reason to find some basis for it. I think that has got to stop and uh, I hope that uh, it does sooner than later. Now let's take that a step further then. We're now in the throes of a presidential election. And if President Trump wins another four years, and I'm asking you to prognosticate a bit and forecast, what might you assume will happen to those individuals who are currently in cages on the southern border? 
Will we move down that continuum, do you believe? You know, I don't want to assume that. So it's full stop. Hmm. Ken, you mentioned, I mean, you, you, you gave us a list and you, yes. you listed 10 things on the way to genocide. Dehumanization obviously was one of those. And given the fact that um, if, for example, we have another four years of Mr. Trump, what might you surmise? Well, you know, as Vet said, it's it's hard to even it's hard to want you don't want to really go there. But if if past is prologue, I, I think we can only expect based on what we've seen so far is the continued dehumanizing of various parts of our society, whether it's whether it's transgenders, whether it's the LBGTQ community, uh, whether it's my immigrants, um, all the signs are, unfortunately, uh, at least in a certain sector of our society, all the signs are there that dehumanizing those people, um, I hate to even say it, but uh, the signs are there that that will continue unless, unless there's a major change in our country. You know, I had felt all the time that uh, in our country, we do have institutions that can take care of them, these kind of issues, but uh, it has not been happening. And uh, I think I, when I said, I don't want to assume that, the reason is that at this stage, if you go there, you don't know what the consequences are going to be. And I do not want to go there at this stage because I think the point is that there are plenty of people in this country with goodwill, but at the same time, those who have got the, uh, not simply the passion, not simply the dedication, but also the capacity. And here, I think I'm thinking of the civil um, um, society, the NGOs. And I think the civil society is the one that has got to take a stand along with all these um, um, structures that we have and institutions that we have, um, because I think uh, that that situation that at the present time has prevailed for the last few months on the Southern border and our violation of all international law norms on refugees, because a very simple feature is that a person who is coming here seeking asylum you must let him in. You must hear his case, our case. You've got to give the person um, a time to put his own best foot forward. And then if under the refugee convention, the person qualifies, you let him or her in. But at the same time, you don't let a person go back, no matter who he is, or she is to a country where she or he is going to be again depressed and facing egregious violations of human rights. And we are doing that. And that is a basic norm in refugee law that you do not send that person back. And uh, I think the point simply would be that this violation and uh, not uh, keeping the faith uh, with our own traditions is something that I I hope that uh, it does not continue. Ken, would you like to uh, comment there? Um, well, I think Vad has said it very well. Um, okay. It's no, nothing really to add. I mean, it's a terrible thing, but as, as Vad says, we don't want to go there, but it may be there. Do you think that uh, those who are being marginalized and dehumanized recognize what is actually happening to them? Do you think they're conscious of the the harm that's being perpetrated? Uh, you know, cognitively. You know, they are they are not, uh, Alfonso. They are not at the present time thinking in those terms as you and I are thinking about. They are suffering. They are in bad shape. They are talking about survival. They are not looking at all these uh, philosophical issues that we are discussing. They know that they are not being treated as humans but they don't have any remedy and they don't know where to go and they don't have at the present time any solace at all. They go back to stay in uh, Mexico 
and uh, then all those people who are praying over them trafficking and all those kind of things have, have been happening so at this stage all that they are thinking about is survival and at this stage what we need to be thinking about them is that one that these are the people who have got certain rights and this is a country that has believed in the rule of law and we need to make sure that that rule of law and those traditions and we keep talking about human rights that those are the issues that we live by not simply that they are in our books and not simply that we preach but we live by them and so that is the need of the hour and i don't think that dehumanization is an issue that comes to their mind and leading to what uh, the next steps that we have talked about atrocities they are already facing them yeah would you agree with that ken i yes i do i there, there are too much focus on, well, for the most part, certainly as everything, there's exceptions, but for the most part, they're so involved and so occupied with just mere survival that they're not thinking about some of these, some of these things, unfortunately. Well, let's stay here for just a moment. Uh, here's a question from um, one, of our, one of our guests. Does the forced sterilization of refugee women at the southern border fit the UN definition of crimes against humanity and what can we do to make it stop? Can you see one expert on crimes <laughs> against humanity? Uh, thank you, Ben. Uh, and further, before, before you go that, and further, there's a question, uh, another question. Can the UN hold the USA government accountable for the forced sterilization of these refugee women? Well, on a, so let me start and say this. On a, on a large enough scale, if, if, if forced sterilization was happening on a large enough scale to possibly lead to the destruction of a group, whether it's an ethnic group, a religious group, some other national, a national group, if that was happening on a sufficiently large scale, it would amount to genocide, uh, number one. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think the UN can speak out against it. The UN, you know, the UN more than anything else is a bully, is the bully pulpit. They don't really ultimately at the end of the day have that much power, but they can shine a light. They can shine a light on human rights violations and abuses. And they certainly can as part of the universal periodic review or based on the work of special rapporteurs. They can in fact criticize and have and, and have. They criticize the United States for various conduct and behavior in our country. And so to that extent, yes, um, probably not sanctions per se, but certainly this, the UN can certainly shine a bright light on, on that conduct and say, this should not be happening. It's a, it's a, sort, of a, it's a sort of a name and shame approach, um, which is not insignificant. That is the extent of what the UN can do. Because the UN, besides that, beyond that, naming and shaming, is unable to do anything to the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States is sitting with a, a veto in the Security Council. Security Council is the only one that can take sanctions and take any action, and no action can be taken in the United Nations against the United States. But certainly, peer pressure that the United States has not really paid any attention to. International Criminal Court, uh, Ken was there in The Hague. I teach it, I work on it. And what has happened recently is kind of shameful that sanctions against the prosecutor, sanctions against international criminal courts officials, and um, um, not even joining the International Criminal Court, but on the other hand, opposing it. Yes. And at the present time, saying about International Criminal Court in such derogatory terms, the only organization that at the present time is capable of saying that those who have committed those heinous crimes, they must be held accountable. And we are the ones in this country who keep talking about justice. And then there is an international body that can provide that. And we are the one who are deeply opposed to it. So I think uh, the policies at the present time are unfortunately not the ones 
that are in the best interest of the United States either. We got no friends left. In the United Nations, we are seen as bullies and we are seen as ones who do not follow the dictate, the norms, basic norms of international law. So I think uh, this stage, the situation is not something that we can be very proud of. Yeah, so I was gonna ask whether that makes us hypocrites, but I think you answered that. We saw today uh, the, the uh, plot foiled to uh, uh, kidnap the governor of Michigan and God only knows what else. Um, how would you describe the use of dehumanization to program and recruit disciples to promote superiority, i.e. the rise of these militia groups? There, there's no question. There's, there's no question that that's part of the dynamic of what's going on. As I said during my part of the presentation, um, we are so deeply polarized. I mean, polarization is a very, uh, at, at the level that we're seeing it in this country, is very close. It's a very close step to dehumanization. Um, I, you know, in my lifetime, and I, I think Ved would probably agree, I've never seen our country so deeply polarized. And when you start having these hate groups that would actually even consider and actually take steps apparently uh, to, to, to kidnap and possibly assassinate a governor of a state it tells us just really how far down that road we've gone. And it is, it, it's, it, it's indeed tragic. I mean, it's, you'd like to think that it can't happen in this country, but um, well, as Ved said before, you don't want to think about that it can happen, but apparently, apparently it can, or it almost did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Ved, would you like to chime in there? No, I think Ken said it. That's fine. Um, I think we have really done. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, there, uh, there's a question about hate speech and America's unwillingness to include such a law against the use of hate speech. How would a law, how would a law such, such as that, that, that uh, criminalizes hate speech affect the First Amendment? Well, <laughs> Dan, do you wanna take that? No, go ahead, I'll follow you. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, in our country, I mean, we have, and I, and, and I believe rightly so, um, because of the First Amendment, we, we tend to go to the other end of the spectrum and say that uh, we respect speech so greatly, even speech that is hateful and un, uh, you know, uh, ugly, uh, but we say uh, you still have a right to say it. Now, it, when it becomes conduct, when it moves from speech to conduct or behavior, then it may be something else. But in speech, uh, we, we have taken the cultural perspective that we, we value and protect free speech almost, some people might say, and I'm, I'm not saying I endorse the view, but some people might say to the extreme. And you know, in my work, and I do a lot of work around Africa, and there are countries, many countries in Africa where you can't even, to insult the national leader, to insult the president or the prime minister is a crime. If you say to the prime minister, oh, that person is an idiot, a person doesn't know what they're doing, and, and some, of which is, <laughs> some of which is almost in our daily dialogue, uh, you would be prosecuted for that. The, the police, the national security people would come and get you and take you away, and you may not ever be seen again. So, you know, it, it is a difficult question. We, we've, we've, taken, we've taken a particular perspective on it at, at one end of the spectrum and how you then judge and juggle that with, with hate speech is a, is a difficult question. Um, but again, we tolerate hate speech, but if it's hate conduct, if it crosses over into what almost seems to appears to have happened with the governor of Michigan, where acts and steps are being planned to actually do something, where speech becomes conduct, then, then we act on it, or we, at least we should. But hate speech is terrible. Hate groups in this country are again, a, ter a terrible blemish on this country, but seemingly uh, getting worse, getting worse every day. As you know, in Europe, most European countries, 
do have uh, their laws and uh, because of the second world war because of what happened there they do not permit that kind of hate speech we have had a society that tolerated each other worked with each other so i was very proud and i still am very proud of first amendment and uh, that we have said that uh, you know it doesn't matter what you are saying because the country itself could tolerate all that uh, in the past a few months uh, maybe years what is really happening in this country uh, is a very sad kind of setting in which uh, the question that you have posed is an appropriate question to ask should all that had happened in the past based upon our culture based upon our traditions not simply on our history but our own current conditions that we can permit that kind of hate speech and still say that we are strong enough that it's not going to affect us but today as you mentioned uh, with the uh, uh, the governor uh, in michigan when you talk about all those hate groups and what southern poverty um, center is doing uh, i think the point simply is that maybe we are coming coming to a point um we are unfortunately in this country also you might have to think about it uh, so um i am um i hope that i am right and i am um, an optimist because if i didn't stay as an optimist i would not be teaching international law so <laughs> as an international lawyer uh I think, I, think I, so more. i think that the country is going to be okay <laughs> thank you sir I think we've got time for one more question and that is why is it the United States in the in, in the international criminal court <laughs> I teach it but can go ahead <laughs> <laughs> Well wow. that's what I was uh, teaching yesterday Well perhaps you should go first Van but I'll I'll, no, no, I'll go, go ahead I'll take, I'll take it briefly I mean you know it's 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 sort of a it's sort of another manifestation of american exceptionalism you know we 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 create these we create many of these international bodies but at the same time we say well except for us you know mm -hmm. we want it for everybody else except for us we don't want to be part of it um there has been a concern at least the stated concern has been well we don't want our troops or our military to be hauled before some foreign court uh to be take, to be held accountable you know that that that's really pretty much nonsense for the most part because the, the international criminal court is based upon the sort of the last resort principle of complementarity and if if the united states is taking care of its own house if we are doing anything um halfway seriously to keep our own house in order and to punish when we have war when our soldiers do commit war crimes and occasionally they do as long as we're doing that I'm dealing with that ourselves through our military justice system or through the civilian justice system there's really no reason to think that we would be find ourselves in front of the ICC the international criminal court but people some people fear that we would the the, the US attitude or posture toward the court has varied during the years uh we signed the treaty but it was never set, it was never ratified and then the, uh, George W Bush withdrew the signature uh the Obama administration was much more favorable to the court while we didn't join the court uh i think it's fair to say the Obama administration actively supported the court uh so it's been a political it's been a political football um and i and i certainly hope that someday we will join the court thank you Jacob can has said it but uh, let me add a footnote and uh, the argument that the united states makes is the argument very technical and legal argument and the argument is we did not join the treaty treaty binds only those states that become part of it the statute we worked on it if you look at the international criminal court and um, ken has looked at it carefully i teach it have looked at it very carefully um, we have had uh, indelible imprint on it it has got uh, the united states uh, um 
imprint on every provision that you can think of. Our own international lawyers put a whole lot of time and effort. So International Criminal Court is our own creation. But then the United States, as uh, Ken said, um, it's an exceptionalism. It said that we are not going to join because as part of a treaty, um, we are not part of it. And uh, the reason is that we said that the uh, prosecutor is going to be given the authority to look into a case and therefore prosecutor might be rogue. American forces are all around and that uh, they might come after us on political grounds. But as Ken said, it's nonsense. There are all kinds of safeguards. At the present time, you probably know what has happened is that in Afghanistan, Taliban, Afghan forces, and the United States through CIA tortured people, had uh, kept people, taken people from there, sent to other places, and tortured. And then so the point is that uh, Afghanistan, prosecutor said, we are going to begin investigation. Investigation, even prosecutor can't do on its own, has got to go through pre-trial chamber. There are judges, have to seek the judge's permission, have to show to the judge why the prosecutor wants to start prosecution, uh, investigation. And investigation begins because there have been many reports, there have been many complaints, there have been memos to the prosecutor that these uh, crimes were committed. And so the prosecutor had gone through it. The first time those judges had said, no, go back, do some more work. And this time the judges permitted them. So the point I want to make is there are plenty of safeguards. Prosecutor cannot act as a rogue, but the United States being the most powerful country, it puts its weight around. In the United Nations, all countries are equal. But in fact, some <laughs> countries are more equal than others. Well, and we the United like States is in that well, category. So that's like the reason. <laughs> so I think we have done enough today. Well, we sound like a superior hypocritical bully. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We want to thank our distinguished guests for a phenomenal, phenomenal discussion tonight. So please help me yeah, thank uh, Dr. Vadnanda and Dr. Ken Scott for their participation. Afonso, may I say one word? Yes. Kindly please. give our warmest regards to Raz Duman. And what she has done, she has been a visionary and she is a doer. And she is dedicated and she has done so much work that uh, you know she did not give up. And I hope that uh, all of you who are working on it as board members don't give up. So this is a cause that's important and thank you for doing it. Thank Absolutely, you. I hope that Roz is hearing that, but certainly if she doesn't hear it, we will make sure that she does. And uh, thank you so much for that, Vet. So uh, we, we at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to again, thank our sponsors. Uh, the Coalition Against Global Genocide, uh, Jewish Colorado, and the Denver Urban Spectrum. Um, the, co uh, the coalition is a 501c3 organization. And so we welcome donations of any size that you would like to make to uh, the organization so that we can continue with this wonderful work uh, that we do. Uh, this webinar, it is available or will be made available on our website. Uh, and so you can, um, you can actually view that. I'm sure they'll have that up uh, here within the next day or so. Uh, we do have two more of these virtual sessions coming up. We are on the second Thursday of the month for November and December. And so our next uh, presentation will be uh, the refusal on behalf of the United States to confront its past atrocities regarding genocide of our native people, uh, Chinese immigrants, and also Africans. In December, our topic will be, uh, we will take a deep dive into the psychology of bystanders and upstanders. And that'll be on December 10. So please stay tuned. 
uh, for those. Watch out for those. And also, please watch out for our uh, national conference coming in 2021, assuming that we can get past our, our pandemic <laughs> that we're dealing with at this time. Um, let's see. Okay. And uh, so here, let's see here, take action. Uh, please vote, Lord, Lord, please vote. <laughs> and what you see on your screen before you are also additional resources that you can access uh, on these topics and others. We certainly welcome you to, um, to uh, chime in and uh, utilize these additional resources that are there for you. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, it looks like the clock is caught up with us. And we would certainly like to thank you for your time. We know that your time is valuable and we do not take it for granted. And we truly appreciate you uh, tuning in with us uh, tonight and look forward to seeing you again next month.